Hi, this is Mike Ritz, W7VO, and now we're going to look at the storied history of the ham radio call sign, plus some ham radio history thrown in for good measure. So let's begin. Every licensed radio amateur in the world really has a unique call sign, and many of us are better known by these call signs than by our given names. But where did it all begin? We're going to look at four periods of call sign evolution the Wild West of Radio, that period prior to 1918, the reconstructive years of 1919 to 1927, the pre-war years of 1928 to 1941, and finally the post-war years, 1947 to the present. So let's take a look at first at the pioneer years prior to 1918, which I'm calling the Wild West of Radio. Why is it the Wild West of Radio? Well, Prior to 1912, there were no wireless regulations in the U.S. at all. It was free range. The U.S. policy of unrestricted stations really differed from most of the rest of the world. As in 1906, the uh, International Radio Telegraph Convention held in Berlin called for countries to license their stations. Although U.S. representatives had signed the agreement, initially the Senate did not ratify the treaty. So the U.S. was told, don't come back until you agree to regulate. U.S. amateur stations made up their own call signs, first with their names, then later shortened to one to three letters or numbers or some combination of them. Commercial and government-owned stations also made up their own call signs with the same one to three letters, so there was a lot of overlap. Spark gap transmitters and the crude receivers at the time really had limited range, so it really didn't matter too much. In order to minimize these duplications of call signs, Modern Electrics Magazine in July of 1908 published the first wireless registry, a list of amateur stations. However, to be listed costs 10 cents, so not everybody made the cut. And here are the first 10 published hams, and you can see they're all using two-letter call signs which match their initials for the most part, except for one guy, uh, the second guy there, uh, Otto Curtis, who just wants to be known as Q. Or if there's any relationship to James Bond there. You can see by May of 1909, they were using three letter call signs for the most part. And a lot of the call signs you'll see have an M after them. And those four, those were four stations who were employees of Marconi. So if you worked another station with an M on the end of the call sign, chances are he was a fellow uh, Marconi employee. In addition to commercial and government stations, about 90 amateur stations were listed in the first edition of the Wireless Blue Book, published in May of 1909. So at this point, things were looking pretty darn good for amateur radio. On April 3rd, 1912, the U.S. Senate formally accepted the 1906 convention, began work on legislation to implement its provisions. Then on April 15, 1912, things all changed rather dramatically. And the question is, what happened on April 15th of 1912? And you may recall from your history books, that was the day that the unsinkable Titanic sank. But what's this have to do with radio? Let's take a closer look. The Titanic had a Marconi-owned wireless station aboard. Call sign, by the way, was MGY. The M st stood and indicated it was a Marconi station. Non-Marconi-owned stations aboard other ships, and most had German telefunken equipment aboard, didn't have to acknowledge them, and sometimes they didn't. They just completely ignored their transmissions. There was also a great deal of both unintentional and intentional interference with Titanic's distress signals. After all, the Titanic was unsinkable. If it was sinking, it must be fake news. There was also confusion over CQD, the distress signal used by all the Marconi ships, versus SOS that the rest of the world had adopted in the 1906 convention. So just a few days later, Marconi was called before the U.S. Senate to testifying hearings, re hearings related to the sinking. And Congress acted very quickly with the Radio Act of 1912. Let's take a closer look at the Radio Act of 1912. It established federal law that mandated that all ships constantly monitor distress frequencies mandated that all radio stations in the U.S. be licensed by the federal government, limited hams to 200 uh, meters of wavelength or lower, about one and a half megahertz or higher frequency, as frequencies higher than one and a half megahertz were considered useless. 
It's a good place to stick hands. The number of US amateurs, however, dropped dramatically at this point from something like 10,000 down to about 1,200. But you know what? The US Navy and commercial interests really didn't want any amateurs on the air anyway. The International Radio Telegraph Convention held in London in 1912 really established the first international prefixes. And we can see here that at that point, A and D and the early part of K were assigned to Germany and W, the later part of K and N were assigned to the United States. F was for France, still that way today. And B, M and G were to break Britain. However, today uh, China has the brief B prefix. And please note, these were really only, these really only applied to commercial stations. Governments didn't require amateurs to, com to com comply. They were just kind of treated separately. So finally, on May 9th of 1913, the United States policy for radio call letters was published, which stated, the call letters for amateur stations in the United States will be awarded by radio inspectors, each for his own district. There were nine districts at the time, numbered one through nine, respectively according to the following system. The call will consist of three items, the number of the radio district, one through nine, followed by two letters of the alphabet, of which those, that first letter could not be X, Y, or Z because those were gonna be reserved. The three items, those uh, that given figure followed by the two letters may be combined into 598 different call signs, which will probably suffice for the amateur sending stations in most districts for some time to come. Well, that's a little short-sighted thinking, one would think. And if the entire 598 call signs have been exhausted, radio inspectors will then begin to issue additional calls consisting of the number, the figure, of the district followed by three letters. And here is where our three-letter suffix came from in our call signs. Those of us that have three letters in our, in our suffix. And so on May 9th, 1913, US amateur call signs are really officially born. So let's take a look at the US radio inspection districts as they existed in 1912. You can see a lot of uh, concentration up in the Eastern seaboard. That's where all the Marconi stations were. And not so, uh, not so dense in the, uh, the Western part of the US. Then on April 7th, 1917, it all changed again. And what major world event occurred on April 7th, 1917? Well, the US officially enters World War I. For the first half of the World War I, the US had been neutral, finally joining the action in April of 1917. Open airwaves were considered a threat to national security at the time, and by executive order, all radio licenses were canceled during the remainder of the war. Radio itself became a monopoly controlled by the US government to be used strictly as a war instrument. And all radios, including receivers, had to be dismantled and all antennas taken down. And oh, by the way, to ignore this order was considered an act of treason. So it was taken very seriously. Radio amateurs, of course, they're all unlicensed now, were encouraged by the ARRL to aid in the war effort by volunteering to help man Navy patrol stations along the coast and enlist as radio operators, and many did. So World War I officially ends on November 11th, 1918, but amateur radio is now dead. There's no no licensed amateurs, there are no transmitters, there's no receivers. So now what? How do we recover from this? So let's take now at the reconstructive years, 1919 to 1927. And really I call this amateur radio arises because really it's a phoenix. It's like the phoenix arising from the ashes. When the war was over, the US Navy argued to the Department of Commerce to keep amateurs off the air permanently. After all, they didn't want them mucking around on their frequencies or interfering with them. The ARRL, however, successfully argued for amateurs to get back on the air again. After all, we were a national resource. And starting in early 1919, amateurs could start reapplying for their licenses again. However, the call signs they had prior to the war were gone. They had to get all new call signs. So at many of the, the uh, uh, radio inspection offices, the, they lined up outside to try to get low suffix assignments. And the question is, has it really changed since then? If you looked outside an Apple store, you might say probably not. By 1920, some districts had run out of the one by two calls. They started issuing the three letter calls, for example, one ABC. 
And here we see 3ADT in Oak Lane, Pen Oak Lane Pennsylvania, uh, looking for some good juicy DX. Some reassignment of one by twos did occur if you knew the right person and probably exchanged a couple of bills his way too. Uh, the Z suffix calls opened up in 1925 for assignment. However, the Y suffix stations were still reserved for school and several schools uh, that I know of still have their original Y call signs. An example of that is Stanford University Club, uh, W6YX, and you hear them in a lot of the contests. And also uh, W6YL at San Jose State University, which is my alma mater. The X suffixes were still for experimental stations at this time and not released for general assignment until 1977. Example of a call sign there is W7XQ, my friend Steve. The two by three format X suffix, however, is still reserved for experimental stations to this day. And uh, so here we have a, a, a QSL card for KA0XTT, which is the call sign for the fictional Mike Baxter on Last Man Standing. So transmitters have gotten a lot better by 1923. Receivers have gotten a lot better by 1923. So international contacts were becoming pretty commonplace. However, hams were still not using the call sign conventions established in 1913, and there were still lots of duplications in call signs. Let's take a look at some QSL cards from the period. Here's 3AY, 3TR, and a QSL card for 3MV. However, if you look closely, you'll see that 3AY is in Canada, 3TR is in Italy, and 3MV is in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So I guarantee you there was also a 3MV not only in the US and Philadelphia, there was a 3MV in Italy and a 3MV in Canada. Well, gee, now what do we do? It gets even, gets even more confusing when the uh, hams begin, as you'll see in a second, to start issuing their own prefixes. So here a guy has stuck a BZ in front of his call. He's 2AL, he calls himself BZ, BZ for Brazil. But if you think about it, B was originally signed to what country? Great Britain. So even more confusion. So how to fix it? Well, hams invented and started standardizing their own prefixes. The unofficial prefix for the United States became a U. So for example, 6ABC, would become U6ABC. Canada started sticking, uh, guys in Canada started sticking a C in front of their call. 7ABC became C7ABC. But what about countries like Uruguay and Colombia? They start with a U, so Colombia starts with a C. So they further refined it. And around 1927 for the North America United States station, they started sticking an N in front of them. So NU6UO, for North America, United States, 6UO, or for example, NC7ABC, North, North America, Canada, 7ABC. Are you confused yet? Well, I know I certainly am, and I'm sure a lot of amateurs still were also. Let's take a look at some early QSL cards from the period. Here's a card for U1SQ. Is this a Russian card? No, take a closer look. You'll find out he's in Marblehead, Massachusetts. Here's U2AZK. Is this station in Moscow? No, take a closer look. He's in New York City. Here's uh, an example of one of the modified call signs. Here's NU1IO, North America, United States, 1IO. Here's another one from Hawaii. Hawaii was part of the sixth call district at the time. So uh, what this guy did was he stuck an H in front of his call sign for Hawaii, United States, 6AJL. Well, things finally got uh, all figured out around 1927 and going into 1928. And let's take now a look at the pre-war years, 1927 and 1941, and things really finally get organized. The Washington Conference Radio Act of 1927 established formal U.S. amateur radio bands, our 20-meter band, our 40-meter band, our 80-meter band, etc., and also put U.S. hams under international prefix rules that were established back in 1913, a full 14 years earlier. Remember that the U.S. was assigned W, a portion of the K and N prefixes, and N was reserved for use by the Navy at that point, and W and K were for civilian and amateur services. 
However, starting in 1928, the amateur K calls will further reserve for the two uh, for US possessions, for example, Alaska, Hawaii, and the other islands. And note here, you don't see anything about A call blocks. They were unassigned until 1947 when we received the AA through AL blocks. So let's take a look at uh, this call sign here, uh, NU, North America, United States 2, Alpha Tango Zulu. In 1928, he became Whiskey 2 Alpha Tango Zulu. And at this point, call signs are now standardized, right? They're all starting with a W, and we know W is United States, and uh, everything is looking good. So now what? What could go wrong? Well, in December 1941, it all changed for amateurs again as the U.S. was pulled into World War II. At that point, all amateur activity was suspended on January 9, 1942, and during the remainder of the war. Unlike World War I, however, the FCC continued to issue operator licenses. After all, that gave the government a ready pool of radio operators and technicians for the Signal Corps. However, there were no station licenses issued. You could have an operator license to operate, but you could not have a station. At least receivers were still allowed at this point, unlike uh, World War I, and civilians were actually encouraged to listen to what the enemy was up to. This policy lasted until the war officially ended in September of 1945. However, amateurs were granted limited permission, only limited permission, to have a station again in November of 1945, and only the 10 meter and two meter bands to start. So ham radio is back again, this time to stay. So let's take a look now at the, uh, finally at the post-war years, 1947 to present, and I'm calling these the glory years of amateur radio. Why? Because I think most people watching this presentation today uh, were licensed, uh, first licensed during this period. The 1947 Atlantic City ITU conference reallocated call sign blocks, giving some developing island nations their own prefixes. Meanwhile, in the US, the call sign districts themselves were moved around to equalize ham populations because the war effort had forever changed US industrial centers. No longer were all the amateurs living on the East Coast working for Marconi now, they're really spread across the country into the middle part of the country and also on the West Coast for the war effort. So a new call district was formed to relieve some of the congestion in District 9, in the Midwest a, a portion of the country. And uh, the sixth district was changed to be California only. And really California is the only state that has their own unique district. And if you moved, you could get a new, you would have to get a new call sign, a, a call sign assigned to the new district. For example, if you move from the East Coast to the West Coast, you could have to change your one call in and get a six clan call, but you might keep your old suffix if it was currently unassigned. However, that rule was changed in 1978 when they went computerized and they eliminated the requirement to change call when you change districts. At this point also, the US possessions had their own prefixes assigned. KL for Alaska, KH6, KH7 for Hawaii, KP3 and KP4 for Puerto Rico, et cetera. So let's take a look at the call sign districts pre-1947. This map should look familiar too. We looked at it a little while ago. And now look at it after 1947 now as it is today. You can see that the nine area is a lot smaller than it was. The zero area has been carved out here, a big chunk of the Midwest. And of course, uh, the seven has been moved around a little bit. Uh, and uh, six is now strictly California. In 1951, a new novice entry-level license class was added. It was a one-year non-renewable 75-watt CW-only HF license. And they all had, be, uh, they started with either a WN or a KN prefix for the contiguous 48 states. And here's an example of one, KN5LAD. Uh, this was in June of 1958. However, the N was dropped when you upgraded. So KN5LAD, when he be upgraded from novice to general, would change his call to K5LAD. So dropping that N really became a rite of passage for many of us in the hobby back uh, in those days. When they ran out of KN and WN calls, they began issuing Whiskey Victor calls, which went to WA calls or WB calls when upgraded. Now I understand there were also some WN calls that were also went to uh, WA and WP call, call signs also. In 
U.S. possessions treated it a little bit differently. They, you remember the U.S. possessions all had K as their first letter. So what they did for novices was they made W's the first letter. So for example, uh, WH6ABC would denote a novice call sign. When they upgraded the general, they would change the W to a K. And for example, WH6ABC would become KH6ABC. And when the FCC system became computerized in 1977, uh, novice licenses dropped the N out of the call sign and they started issuing KA calls and also went to sequential calls. At that point also, uh, generals were getting uh, N calls, November calls. So let's go ahead and wrap this up for you guys today. So what a wild ride are, are both our call signs and our hobby have taken over the years, right? They had no call signs, wild, wild west, uh, to the point where we, everything was looking good, then we lost the hobby, then we got it back, then we partially lost the hobby, then we got it back, and here we are today. Keep in mind that none of us really own our call signs. They're really just leased to us by the FCC for our lifetime, and as long as we keep our license renewed. Um, I'm W7VO, the W7VO call sign can be traced back to 1923, and I'm the fifth holder of the call. So please take good care of our call signs so they can be enjoyed and cherished by future generations of ham. And I'm Mike Ritz, W7VO, and I wanna thank you for watching and enjoy the rest of the QSO Today Virtual Ham Expo 2021. Thank you.